She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, all of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free, but I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom, a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to our show tonight. I am your host, Doris Hansen, and we're grateful that you've decided to share some of your evening with us tonight. First of all, I would like to mention that next Monday, July 30th, from 6.30 until 8 p.m., we are having our monthly Life After Polygamy Support Discussion Group meeting. We're going to um, uh, have a lot of people there from different polygamy groups, and if you have been uh, touched by polygamy in any way, you are invited to come and share or just sit and listen. We always have some great discussions. So bring a friend and come on down. Um, it is um, as from 6.30 until 8 p.m. Monday evening, July 30th. And if you want more details about it, you can email us or give us a call and leave some contact information. I'd also like to mention that next week we celebrate our 200th live television show broadcast. And we want to invite you to be part of our celebration. You can come down here and be part of our live audience or you can be sure and tune in. We're going to be dedicating the show to the non-existent Lamanites, and we have a special Lamanite guest, so join us uh, for the celebration of our 200th show next week on Polygamy, What Love Is This? And tonight I need to remind our viewers that when we talk about doctrine, we discuss what polygamists believe and what they believe came from early Mormonism. So don't call us or email us complaining that our show isn't addressing just the polygamous. If you believe the doctrine that we're talking about, then our show is obviously about what you believe. And tonight we're going to discuss the Mormon myth of a pre-mortal existence and how, when it's brought to its logical conclusion according to Mormon's own doctrine, it is quite shocking. Despite the many remarks that were made by early Mormon leadership claiming that their religion can be verified by the Bible, the pre-existence is clearly denied by biblical teaching. And we wonder how all the religious groups that are based on Mormonism, that have a Mormonism foundation, how they, can, how they can say that they believe and follow Jesus Christ when they don't believe and practice what Jesus himself taught. For instance, regarding the pre-existence, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 23, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Jesus said that, and from that statement alone, from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself, who himself identified himself as being the truth, told us that we did not come down from above. He did, but we did not. Jesus also said in John chapter 3, verses 31 through 33, He who comes down from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. 
He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his t testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. Now, only Jesus came down from above. He said so. He testified to that. And then Jesus accused his listeners because they would not receive his testimony. It's interesting because Mormonism, the people in the Mormon religions, expects us to receive them and to believe their testimonies, but they won't accept the testimony of Jesus Christ. We wonder how that can be. Our guest tonight is Charles Larson. He's been on our show before. We always enjoy having him. He's very familiar with Mormon doctrine, and he is the author of the book, uh, By His Own Hand Upon Papyrus, which proves that the Book of Abraham is a spurious document at its best. And we welcome and thank you again, Charles Larson, for coming on our show. Doris, it's my pleasure. I'm always glad to be here. <laughs> and it's always great to have you here. We have some wonderful subjects that we talk about, and we do hope that it's making a difference uh, with our listeners, at least some of our listeners. You have an interesting and thoughtful approach to the doctrine of the preexistence that the early Mormon church developed in spite of what Jesus Christ taught. Is there any firm basis for a belief in the premortal existence, and is it, can it be considered a Christian doctrine? Not really. Uh, there's no. There, people can take some scattered biblical verses from time to time, uh, which seem to imply that uh, that God knew a person before they existed. Mm -hmm. and that's really about the gist of it. Um, Mormon doctrine, on the other hand, uh, implies an entire realm of, of a state of being a uh, a family. Uh, it, it's very convoluted. Mm -hmm. Christianity. Uh, a lot of Christians have differing ideas on things, and poets have speculated about the idea of a pre-mortal existence, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have uh, writers and poets and so forth, like, like Wordsworth, for example. Okay, there's a very uh, short section of a very long poem that he wrote at one time that Mormons are very fond of quoting, and I remember when I was... Uh, uh, when I was a, just a young convert or an investigator, I was confronted with this poem from Wordsworth when I was being introduced to the idea of the pre-existence. And, oh, it just struck me so beautiful. I, yeah. I, I, I wonder, do they have a, 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 a card of that that they can put up on the screen? Uh, I, I think mm -hmm. we have some graphics of that. Did you okay. want to quote what he said? Sure. Or, let's, or? Let's, let's go ahead and put that up and, and let our readers look at it. Uh, Mormons will remember this and... And non-Mormons should should be aware of that. I mean, this is this is Wordsworth. Okay, he was uh -huh. not he was not a Mormon, he was a, a poet. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what he what he wrote was, uh, "Our birth is but a sleep in a begetting, a forgetting." Okay, the soul that rises with us, our life star has had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar, not an entire forgetfulness and not an utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Uh huh. Okay, now oh. When I first heard that, I just had this incredible sense of deja vu. Okay, oh, yeah? yes, I, the veil is being rent, and I am perceiving the preexistence, and that's exactly the the type of uh, frame of mind that that Mormon missionaries and Mormons alike would like the convert to to approach it with. Mm -hmm. Of course, Wordsworth was, was one poet, but, but there's a lot of of mythology and perceptions and poetry in 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 the secular realm as well. There was a, I wasn't around at the time this movie was made, but <laughs> Shirley Temple did a horrid movie that was the biggest box office flop ever. It was her only box office flop called The Blue Bird of Happiness. Oh. Okay, and this was about a naughty little girl in, in around the turn of the 19th century, you know, 1800 or so, who uh, needed to learn a lesson, and I guess that's one of the reasons the movie flopped, because Shirley Temple couldn't be portrayed as a bad little girl. Mm, probably, but, uh, yeah. There was one scene in there in particular where in a dream, Shirley Temple goes to heaven and she sees all the children waiting to be born. Oh my. Okay. So all these children are waiting to be born and they're lined up to go down to earth. And there's this one very sad and solemn young boy, Abraham Lincoln, who's going down to accept his destiny and so forth. Again, it was a horrible movie. <laughs> 
But it shows that this, this concept was, was in the secular realm. It was not at all uncommon. There may have been some Mormon influence toward that movie in particular, but the idea is not unusual. Uh -huh. uh, so, the idea for a pre-existence isn't unusual. No, people have developed, and, and, and frankly, Joseph Smith probably didn't come up with it all on his own either. It's part of folklore. It's part of. It's an apocryphal type of thing. Yeah. There are many teachings that, uh, well, think there aren't even teachings. They're just ideas and concepts. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, you know, there there are probably Christians today who believe that that God created our spirits in heaven and then sent them to. Uh, you know, gave you know, joined them to a body on earth instead of creating them simultaneously. And, and then the Christians yeah. claim that heaven is our home, and, oh, sure. and that our citizenship is in heaven. Oh, and so, yes. and, and, and so that, that when a person dies, they are going home or being called home. So, mm -hmm. it, it, it's not an unusual type of a thing for a Christian to feel that the the doctrine of preexistence is a familiar thing, uh, as, as you've shown at the beginning. Though there's there's really not a scriptural basis for us in the scripture can be used to show that this is not how it happens. Absolutely can be. Okay. And I want to say again that polygamists are included in, in our remarks when we refer to Mormonism as uh, as they are with all the pet doctrines, most of the basic doctrines of Mormonism. And I was taught, born and raised in a polygamy group, and I was taught the pre-existence from as early as oh, I can remember. Um, now, you said that the preexistence is one of their favorite doctrines. It's kind of a comfort oh, doctrine absolutely, to them. Absolutely, absolutely. Mormons feel that they have a, uh, a title to the idea of preexistence because, after all, Joseph Smith taught that this was a doctrine. And so since Joseph Smith was a prophet and he was introducing doctrines which the real Christian church had dropped or forgotten or abandoned, then they feel like they're entitled to that. They have a special knowledge of something. Yeah. But you know, the truth is, Doris, the special knowledge that they have is, is so speculative and arbitrary because most Mormons have no idea what their leaders really taught or what the concept of preexistence really means. Uh, there, there's a cute little, <laughs> a cute little song in a, in a book uh, called Music in the Broken Word. Now this is a, mm -hmm. this is a, one of the Mormon spoof books. You know, it's written by Mormons for Mormons, and they're poking fun at themselves. Uh -huh. Okay, but the cute little song it goes: uh, We love to dwell on the preexistence of all our doctrines. We like it best, since no one knows one darn thing about it. One's guess is just as good as the rest. <laughs> it provides grist for bad Mormon fiction, and it gives comfort to that great clan who think they're saved by family connection rather than by the gospel plan. Oh, okay. my goodness. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> uh, again, that, that, that's harmless you know, for Mormons. It, it's healthy to poke fun at yourselves. But yeah. there, there's a little see the truth in that though too okay mormons really don't can believe anything that they want about pre-existence as long as it makes them feel good there is no solid idea behind it among most mormons again because they're not familiar with the teachings of their leaders well and they can't take the they can't take the questions when you dig into it they go no. back very far they can't answer those questions no they can't and and you you talk to your leaders you know you might as well go ahead and look turn to the bad mormon fiction you'll get a lot more answers than you will from the church leaders mm -hmm. but even at the end of that little ditty okay uh you notice that the writers of it, being Mormon, show some respect for the concept of the gospel plan. Okay, now mm -hmm. the gospel plan. As a Christian, knowing other Christians, I have never, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, someone, okay, but I have never heard the gospel referred to as the gospel plan. It has always been the gospel. Not in the Bible. No, yeah. it, it is the gospel. It is, it is, it is, the atonement of Christ for the sin of mankind in order to unite and reconcile man before God. Mm -hmm. That is the gospel. That's the gospel. Okay. The gospel plan, on the other hand, the way that the Mormon church uses the term, is really the plan of eternal progression. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ plays only a small role in the eventual exaltation of man. You, the, the, the eternal progression is about a an anthropomorphic God propagating his own species by begetting spirit children in heaven, 
passing them through a second estate on Earth and allowing them mm -hmm. to progress and eventually become the same species as he is, mm -hmm. just as he himself did at one time as a man, progressing to become the same, become a god. So in the, in the Mormon um, plan, as they put it, would you say that they kind of turned it around as though that instead of God first and then man, they say man first and then they become God? So yes, men but, came remember, first, not God. but remember, each, each man who becomes God does so by honoring and worshiping a God. But before him. Okay. okay, so this is part of the problem that we're running into. It is. Is, is going back to the first. Well, yeah, you, you run up against a couple of fallacies, uh, a couple of paradoxes. Okay, and, and the first one that I'd like to talk about there is called the first God paradox. Uh huh. Okay. Joseph Smith very clearly taught that, that God was a man at one time. Mm -hmm. Okay, he did. In, in his King Follett discourse, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. the, uh, <laughs> the King Follett discourse was given just a few months after Wolfer Woodruff came up with his little ditty about as man, let's see, as God is. How did it let's go? see, that was Lorenzo yeah, as Snow. As man is God once was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lorenzo Snow. Lorenzo Snow, thank mm -hmm. you. As, as, as God is, man. As man, man is, is, God once was. I always get that mixed up as because God it's so <laughs> silly. <laughs> it's, it's, okay. it's very confusing. Yes. As, 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 as God now God is, man, man once. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, you know what I mean. Okay. But he had that thought during a dream, and he went and told it to Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith said, that is of God. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. a couple months later, he's giving the King Follett discourse, and he'd been messing around with this idea for a long time anyway. Mm -hmm. And so he really developed the theme in the King Follett discourse that, you know, I'm going to tell you a great secret. You know, people have supposed God was always God from all eternity, but I'm going to refute that idea and take away the veil so you can see. Okay, God that sits enthroned in yonder heavens was once a man as we are now. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and you have got to learn to be gods yourselves. Okay, that was what he taught. Yeah, it, okay. it was there. What's interesting in the King Follett is that he says, you've got to learn how to be gods yourselves, to be kings and priests, and um, to go from one exaltation to another. But in that same discourse, he says that there's only one true God. Yeah, he does. And so how, if there's only one true God, how can anyone be a God? They're not a true God then. Well, that's, let's, let's I mean, talk if about better. eternal progression and, and go back to Joseph Smith's progression. Okay, Joseph Smith's theology and his writings and his teachings and his whole concept of God evolved certainly from the very beginning. Yes, it did. Now, you, you know that uh, in, as early as 1830, he was working on producing an inspired version of Genesis. Uh -huh. This is where he would fill in all the blanks and, uh, you know, when God was directly inspiring him to write exactly what God had originally had Moses write. That was the story. Mm -hmm. Okay, seriously, yeah. that, was, that was the story, folks. So in, in the, uh, the book of Moses, he depicts God as the creator of all. Okay, and he depicts God as a, as a creating being who of his own word and power spoke and, and brought about the universe. And, he, you know, he, you know that that he believed, or he wanted people to believe, that he was really getting this from God because he threw in little verses about, now this part of the story is going to be lost and someday somebody will restore it. So don't worry, Moses, but I'm telling you the way that it is now. <laughs> that, that's part of the mm -hmm. book of Moses, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Where he's telling the story about God being the creator, the, the sole driving force, the architect of the universe and all being. Okay, now fast forward. 14 years to the King Follett Sermon, or, or 13 years, 12 years to the Book of Abraham. In the Book of Abraham, he is writing exactly the same thing, only this time the way that God dictated it to Abraham some years before Moses, some mm -hmm. centuries before Moses. And here, all of a sudden, every time that the Book of Moses says God, the book of Abraham says, the gods. gods. Uh -huh. Go ahead and transpose sometime the book of Moses, chapter 4, with the book of Abraham, chapter 4. And you will find a perfect example of Joseph Smith's evolution of his, his deity, uh, the deity that he wanted people to understand from 1830 to 1842, 43. He changed, he changed, he changed it totally. Instead of having a creator God 
who was the architect of the universe. He has a, a labor foreman who is working with a council of the gods in order to go ahead and create the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Mormon's gospel plan then actually, in a word, includes God propagating himself as a species. Propagating himself as a species. Now let's go and look at that because I wanted to talk about that first paradox. This is where we're getting into an area where Mormons generally just like the warm, fuzzy idea of, of a pre-existence being born of God uh, in heaven and then coming to earth for a reason, to get a body so that they can progress, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's really all that most Mormons understand about this. But look at the idea of eternal progression. If God had became God by being a man first, just as we are, mm -hmm. the only way he could become God would be by following the gospel plan, mm -hmm. by worshiping a God and being faithful and obedient to all of the ordinances and everything else that needed to be done in order to progress to become God. That means that he had a God that he worshiped. Yes. Where did that God come from? That God would have also had to evolve from having been a man. Okay. Right. See, Joseph Smith was trying to overcome the concept of eternity. He thought that eternity was a stupid idea and it was incomprehensible to most people. And he spent the latter years of his life trying to go ahead and refute the idea of an eternal God and put it in terms that were graspable. Is that a real word? <laughs> <laughs> graspable, but <laughs> able to be grasped by most people. And the idea of, well, you're born from your parents and then you have children and they have children, and your parents had parents, and so forth. So you put God in that same scheme, you put man in that same scheme, and we're all the same species. So that seemed to make sense. That that's as far as most Mormons go with it. But we can't reconcile the biblical teaching to what Joseph Smith No, we can't. Taught. But remember, Joseph Smith frequently threw out the Bible whenever it was convenient for him. Okay, so that's... Well, that was often. Yeah, so, and that was often. So, you know, we, we won't even consider that a problem right here. Let's look instead just at the idea that every time... A man becomes a god, he did it by worshiping a god in front of him, mm -hmm. who also was a man who had to become a god by worshiping a god in front of him. The paradox, folks, is where did the first god come from? By Joseph Smith's definition, it would be impossible for there to even be a first god. Well, actually, it would be where did the first man come from, because it had, takes a man to become a god. But, but the man always comes from worshiping a god. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Okay, we the, which came first, the god one, or we, the man? Yeah, we... <laughs> okay, so, so you know, I, I once posed that question, you know, where does the first god come from that causes all of this to happen? Mm -hmm. And how did he become a god? Okay, and this, this LDS man that I posed the question to, thought a couple of minutes, then got very spiritual and said, eternity is really like one great eternal round that closes back in upon itself so that there's no end and no beginning to it. Well, you know, I heard that same talk about the wedding ring when I was going through the Manti Temple being sealed to my first and last and only wife. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I told the guy right off the bat, I said, that does not make sense because if you, eternity is just one big circle that closes back in on itself, then somewhere along the line, I am my own God's fifth great-great-great-grandfather, okay? And <laughs> how can I possibly worship a being that is my own offspring? Yeah. Okay, yeah. no, that, that's, yeah. that's stupid. That doesn't make sense, okay. So that's the first paradox, is that there could be no first cause. With, with, <laughs> with Christianity, God is the first cause because he's eternal, okay. Joseph Smith could not grasp the idea of an eternal God, only of an eternity filled with an endless progression that demands a beginning that cannot exist. But where do they get the definition for eternity? To them, eternity to, to, to a Mormon, the idea of eternity is, is basically moving on. It's progression, okay? It's eternal progression. In other words, there's no end to that. But even though Joseph Smith wrote early in his early writings about a God who was God from all eternity, right. he would refute that idea at his death. And the whole idea of a pre-existence that encompasses eternal progression of man becoming God because God had once been a man and we're propagating our species, it denies the idea of an eternal God. 
So in order to set it straight in, in the, what we're talking about, e to the, the biblical definition of eternity is forever and ever in the past and in forever and ever in the future. In both directions, in both beginnings. Right. Before the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang even had a primer put on it. It was okay. <laughs> it's from all eternity to all eternity. Right. Okay, that is right. God. Absolutely. The architect of all creation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the first paradox. Okay. Okay, but... There's an even bigger one. Okay. When you get into the book of Abraham, you get the story of how all of this came about in heaven, okay, mm -hmm. with the Council of the Gods. Do you remember the Council of the Gods from your... Um, yes, I remember learning okay. about it. And, now, and you, you were raised in a polygamous environment. That is a Mormon uh -huh. environment. Uh -huh. and, the, and polygamous Mormons, just like non-polygamous Mormons and modern Mormons teach about the Council of the Gods right. because they have the Book of Abraham. Right, right, right. Okay. What you've proven is well, yeah, whatever. But, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Doris. <laughs> the Council of the Gods in the Book of Abraham. Okay. Uh, Joseph Smith starts out with his retranslation of Genesis saying, in the beginning the, the head of the gods called a Council of the Gods and they concocted a plan to create and populate the earth. Right. Uh, yeah. in, in Hebrew, that is Bereshith uh, Barach Elohim, and Joseph Smith, you know, developed all kinds of things from that and got the Hebrew wrong all over the place. And well, we won't even go into that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you have this Council of the Gods now. As a Mormon young girl, as a polygamous Mormon young girl, whatever, how did you conceive of this? Council of the Gods. What was the picture that comes to your mind when I say Council of the Gods? Well, uh, kind of like a board of directors meeting. Sure. It's a <laughs> bunch of white-haired, glowing men sitting around a celestial table someplace, right? Yeah. yeah okay. Well, I think like that, that that's probably how most Mormons perceive the idea of the Council of the Gods when they read that in the Book of Abraham. I'm going to suggest something different here. Okay. Okay. And it ties in with Joseph Smith teaching that God is propagating his own species by giving us a spiritual body in heaven, then a physical body on earth to put that spiritual tabernacle into, or a spiritual body into the physical tabernacle and then progress and so forth. If God is doing that, how can God possibly create the spirit of a horse? God is a humanoid. He is creating his own species when he begets us. How does he create a fish? How does he create a squirrel or a dinosaur or a dragonfly? Each species on earth would have to have its own physical, similar form of God creating spirit offspring in that form in order to give it a second estate in well, a similar body. Well. Okay, because remember, God is not a creator. God is a begetter in Mormon doctrine. That's right. Okay. So that means that there has to be essentially a horse god and a dog god and a cat god and a fish god and a dinosaur god. Well, you, you want to get into the different species, there has to be a Tyrannosaurus god and an Allosaurus god and a raptor god. So you're okay. saying the council of the gods have all these Exactly, different... exactly. Now, doesn't the book of Abraham say that, you know, there are greater intelligences and lesser intelligences and no two intelligences are the same and I am greater than them all. This is God the Father speaking. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. These beasts of heaven, these exalted beasts of heaven would be the council of the gods. Okay, because they were going to go and, oh, you'd have, you'd have <laughs> oak tree gods, you'd have elm tree gods, you'd have raspberry bush gods, you'd have oh grass gods well, and dandelion yeah, gods. Yeah. Okay, you'd have to have a mosquito god and a, and a tsetse fly god and uh, all of, uh, I'm not trying to be rude or cruel or facetious here. This is where the doctrine inevitably leads. When you get to the idea of believing that God is propagating his own species, not creating it, every other species would have to follow the same role. And I don't believe that, well... <laughs> well, according to the way, the, the way that it's taught, it the, has yeah. to. The way that it's taught, it has to. There is no other way that makes sense. Right. This council of the gods that Joseph Smith is talking about in the book of Abraham, that he purports God is talking about would have to be made up of all of these beings of every species that ever lived and went extinct on the earth 
not only human, but it would have to be every animal, every form of animal, every fish, every bird, every insect, every uh, tree, every bush, every blade of grass, every every type of discrete species. And I, it's been a long time since I've taken botany. Okay, <laughs> but I cannot remember how many hundreds of thousands of different discrete species there are which do not interbreed with each other. Okay, mm -hmm. it can, you can't mix... You can't mix a, a dandelion with a cat and get something in between. Mm -mm. Okay, you can't even mix a cat and a dog, except you, if you want a good fight. <laughs> okay. No, no, you, you really can't. Okay. So, so that would be the council of the gods. All of these different species of gods that you know, the humanoid God would have dominion over, just as Adam was given dominion over the earth and all of the beasts of the earth in mm -hmm. the physical form. Mm -hmm. That's the Mormon council of the gods. Now, lest anyone think that this is Charles Larson going absolutely nuts and, and so forth. You found a quotation that I, I dearly I did. Love. I found a quotation. Mm -hmm. um, we will, it's from Orson Pratt, <clears throat> excuse me. And I want to quote that. I want to put it up on the screen as I quote it. But right now, I think what we'll do is break for the, <clears throat> uh, for our message, our mid uh, show you. message and open up the telephone lines. Okay. And then after we give the message, then we can put that quote up on the screen right. so that so that our viewers can see that he's not just sitting around just making me. stories really, up. It it's based okay. on something that Orson Pratt actually wrote about in his book, The Seer. So we're opening up our telephone lines now. The number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. We'd love to have you call in and give us your um, input on the conversation tonight. We'd love to hear from you. Be sure and turn your volume down once you're on the air. And as we are waiting for your calls to come in, we will share our ministry message <laughs> with you. You are watching Polygamy, What Love Is This? Broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This program is the broadcast outreach of A Shield and Refuge Ministry. Shield and Refuge is a point of first contact for Mormon fundamentalists who question the doctrines of the religion or who are actively seeking for an opportunity to escape the polygamist lifestyle. Examining the claims of fundamentalist doctrine against the backdrop of biblical truth is central to our efforts. We invite you to contact us. Call toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at TV at aboutpolygamy.com. You are welcome to join us in our monthly support group, Life After Polygamy, where you can meet others like yourself who are searching for answers about polygamy and Mormon fundamentalism. We meet monthly in the Salt Lake City area. For more details about time and place, call us toll free at 877 425 9993 or email us at TV at aboutpolygamy.com. We want you to know that we have made available to you some outstanding resources free of charge. You will find them at our website, www.whatloveisthis.tv. There you will find the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, which documents the real life stories told firsthand of those who were lifted out of the culture of polygamy through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Also, free of charge to you is the booklet, Is Polygamy Biblical? It explores plural marriage in the context of God's Word and answers questions like, Did God ever command polygamy? Is it part of God's plan? While you are at our website, make sure to take advantage of the archived episodes of this program, which can stream on demand directly to your computer. There are more than 100 shows to choose from. And if someone you know is unable to view this program via live broadcast, Recommend that they visit this same website every Thursday at 8 p.m. Mountain Time to watch this show through live streaming video. Simply follow the links to the live streaming video page. If you are watching live tonight, we invite you to call us as we open our phone lines. The number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Now, Back to Polygamy, What Love Is This? with our host, Doris Hansen. Well, welcome back to our show. 
Uh, we are talking about the pre-existence and something that is intrinsic in Mormon doctrine, whether it's polygamy groups or mainline Mormon church, the pre-existent is um, a doctrine that they all believe in because Joseph Smith taught it. Our guest is Charles Larson. He's here uh, bringing us into a, a new concept, not a new concept, but a concept perhaps that, that most people haven't thought of before, that the, the logical conclusion of the pre-existence brings us into the God um, of the spirits of all creation, including animals and vegetables. Um, we wonder um, who's telling the truth because, you know, the Bible is very clear that there is no pre-existence. And the Mormon church is very clear that they believe in one. So we wonder who's telling the, who, who's telling the lie here. Is it God who's lying to us about it or is it the Mormon doctrine that is not correct? I'd also like to mention here we do have some calls coming in. We invite you uh, to continue to try to call in. But I want to bring up Alma chapter 11 in the Book of Mormon yeah. where we find okay. that, that Joseph Smith did not believe in many gods. He was very clear about it. And if we can put this up on the screen, I would like to quote Alma chapter 11 beginning with verse 26. So this is 1820s when he's he hasn't developed all of these other things yet. The other ideas haven't evolved with it. That's mm -hmm. true. And uh, verse 26, says, Zizram said unto him, Thou sayest there is a true and living God. And Amulek said, Yes, or yea, there is a true and living God. Now Zizram said, Is there more than one God? And he answered, No. And Zizram said unto him again, How knowest thou these things? And he said, An angel hath made them known unto me. Now we go down the same chapter, down to verse 38, to continue the conversation. Now Zizram said unto him, Is the Son of God the very eternal Father? And Amulek said unto him, Yea, he is the very eternal Father of heaven and of earth, and all things which in them are. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And he shall come into the world to redeem his people, and he shall take upon him the transgressions of those who believe on his name. And these are they that shall have eternal life, and salvation cometh to none else. So we can see that he believed. Now this was pretty close to, to biblical doctrine. Not it, quite, it really is. Not and quite really when, it, but close. When a Mormon, or when, a, when, a, when any person is being introduced to Mormonism, this is what they get. They're told, read the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. pray about whether what you read is true, mm -hmm. and if you can say, well, yeah, that sounds good, That's, I understand that. All you have to do is commit yourself to the idea that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and the Book of Mormon is true, and you're baptized. Yeah. Once you're baptized, you've taken upon yourself an obligation and many other things that you've made an investment. You've invested in believing what there is. Now, it may be a month or two months or six months before you find out that they believe that God was once a man and that men become gods like it was with me. When I first heard that, I thought, oh my gosh, there's a horrid her heresy going yeah, through going the ward. I've yeah. got to go tell the bishop. Yeah. <laughs> and the bishop smiled at us and said, no, no, that, that really is doctrine. And because I trusted him, because I'd made my investment, I'd made my commitment, I said, all right then, I'll believe that. And a Mormon grows line upon line and lie yeah. upon lie yeah. until they mm -hmm. believe everything that they're told because they trust it. So despite the fact that they do believe in many gods and the eternal progression into godhood, mm -hmm. Joseph Smith originally taught there's only one God. Right. Now let's talk, go to Orson Pratt in uh, The Seer. Yes. Now we have this book, The Seer, uh, which was written by Orson Pratt, an early prophet and apostle of the Mormon church. Right. And he said on page 38 about the vegetation and the animals um, of the earth. He said, when the world is redeemed, the vegetable creation is redeemed and made new as well as the animal. Now he is saying in, in this passage that we're going to read some more that the, origi the origin of spiritual vegetables is heaven. And this is the quote, quote, these spiritual vegetables are sent from heaven to the terrestrial worlds where, like animals, they take natural tabernacles, which become food for the sustenance of the natural tabernacles of the animal creation. Thus, the spirits of both vegetables and animals are the offspring of male and female parents, which have been raised from the dead or redeemed from a fallen condition with the world upon which they dwelt." End quote. I am absolutely, I was thunderstruck when you shared that with me. 
Which is exactly the conclusion It is exactly what I had described as the natural conclusion of believing Joseph Smith's concept of eternal progression. Okay, so this is not just Charles Larson getting weird on you. <laughs> this is Orson Pratt, who, while he was never a president of the church, he was called as an apostle and, and as a prophet. a prophet. He definitely okay, was. Okay, that was mm -hmm. part of his calling. He is not speaking offhand to his caddy on the golf course. He is writing a discourse on doctrine for the saints as an apostle, as one called as a prophet. He is, this is one of those sources that Mormons do not go to to answer their questions. This is one of those sources that is ignored when most people try to think about all of these things that otherwise would give them warm, fuzzy feelings. This is the real teaching behind, the real implication behind the Mormon teaching of pre-existence. So the vegetables had a spirit? The Each vegetable, yeah, and, and not just one vegetable god for every vegetable. There was a tomato god. There right, was a right. corn god. There That's was a wheat god. There was a string bean god. That's right. Okay, it it has to right. be because they don't Interbreed. That's what he taught, okay. and that's page 38 of the Seer. Anybody want to get yep. it and read it? Okay. Don't don't call in and call us liars until you check it out right. for yourself. Mm -hmm. So let's take some phone calls. We have on line one, Kaziah. Hello, Kaziah. Hey. Hello, girl. Woman, I'm so dang thankful for you guys that dare to use your brain. <laughs> Huh. to have Thank his you. guest on there and the wisdom that he's come up with. I love the way he explained that. That's good. Oh, my gosh. And here's another thing that I want to say. Isn't it just nuts to think that, you know, we're created in, a, in the spirit world and then we spend thousands or hundreds of thousands of years in the spirit. What are we doing? We're sitting around picking our nose. Not a flippant thing to do. We just wait. <laughs> wait to be You know, God does and not waste one minute. Absolutely not. Yeah, and it, see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with the salvation uh, of what the Bible, like we say, the salvation plan of Mormonism and the salvation plan of of, of Jesus Christ. Right. It's just uh, uh, worlds apart. Absolutely. You know, when 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 Gaziah was mentioning this, uh, uh, thought occurred to me <laughs> about Mormons who won't eat meat. Okay, they feel that that's wrong. And I countered one of them once. I said, do you realize that by not eating meat, you are denying cows, spirit cows, their right to come to earth and receive a second estate in a body so that they can progress and become a cow god. <laughs> what are, what's going to become of all those pre-existent cows? Listen, I'm not going to take up any more time, but I love you guys. Thank God for your program, and thank God for this wonderful man that's got a brain, and, and of course for you, you're amazing. Thank you, Kaziah. Thank you. Thank you, Kaziah. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks <laughs> for calling. Uh, you know what you just said. It, it, one of part of Orson Pratt's um, remarks here were that they were for the sustenance of the natural tabernacle well, sure. of the animal mm -hmm. creation. So they were made so we could eat them, according to him. Did you ever wonder what ever happened to the tobacco god? Oh, geez. Oh, he's, man. He's been oh. prejudiced against. He huh? certainly has. Whoa. Oh, I feel bad for him. I do, too. The barley god. And too. her, too, his wife. Okay. Yeah, so. <laughs> Life to Scott in Bountiful. Hello, Scott. Hi, uh, folks. A uh, real interesting topic. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Larson. Uh, okay. Have you ever heard of the Raelians? Uh, this oh, yes. religion that this guy out of France invented. Um, I have not, uh, Scott. They believe in... Uh, it has a lot to do with cloning, and they actually believe that uh, different gods came down from a planet, and each god was in charge of cloning all the different species. It's called Raelians. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, you ought to look into it. This, 
this discussion today is really reminding me a lot of that, and it, and it seems like we could easy, more easily put the Mormons in with the Raelians or the Scientologists rather than the Christians. Thank you. I'll, yeah. I'll stop and listen. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Thank I, you, I would Scott. have to say that you, you could be very right there. Joseph Smith certainly was fond of railing against Orthodox Christianity, so. Yeah. <laughs> Could yeah be. No, no, thank you for that information. I, it, it just goes to show that there is no new idea under the sun, let alone any new, any new heresy. Okay. And, and you know, it kind of fit, doesn't it fit into the category of Greek mythology and oh, Roman course. mythology? Where well, particularly <laughs> Egyptian mythology with all of the animal gods, but yeah, oh, I'd better yeah. not say that because then the Book of Abraham Defenders will say, you see, there's a, there's a connection there. There are animal gods in Egyptology and there are animal gods in pre-existence. Well, so the wrong obviously dots. <laughs> Joseph Smith was a true prophet. <coughs> they, okay. they connect in the wrong they dots connect the if wrong they dots, do that. Exactly. That's right. for sure. Okay, we have okay. Uh, Tony calling on line three in mm. Salt Lake. Hello, Tony. You, hello, Tony? Yes, I got, just you, got a quick question. You need, to turn down your, the, you need to turn the volume down on your TV, please. Yeah, it gives a feedback. Completely yeah. down. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I, I can, can hear you. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. I just got a quick question. I know you guys mentioned all about the gods and all that yes. good stuff from the LDS Church. Mm -hmm. um, I just got a quick question. Um, you know how when Jesus is being baptized, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess there's a voice and say, hey, this is my son or so-and-so? Right. I'm just kind of confused. Between, isn't that like the God talking to himself? You know what I'm saying? It doesn't yes. make no yes. sense. Well... Frankly, you understand what I'm saying? I understand mm -hmm. what you're saying, yes. The, the, Hello? You, you, yes, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm almost you know, stumbling over my tongue here. The Christian concept of God is as a triune God, God in three forms. God could be God the Father at the same time that he was also God the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, I mean, you've got a manifestation of all three of the Trinity at Jesus' baptism. You have the physical man getting baptized. You have God the Father's voice. You have the Holy Spirit in the manifestation of a dove. Okay, all of them together. The idea is not to try to see, let's see if we can separate these things and, and line them up one at a time and put them each in a box. The idea of of the Trinity and the concept of God as a Christian is to put them together. This was done as a manifestation of one God at the time. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, one God, yeah. three persons. And so the, the he wasn't talking to himself, he was talking to his father. Uh, but when, when in, in the biblical language, when Jesus said that claimed to be God's son, the Hebrews, the Jewish people knew he was claiming to be God. Yes. Because they picked up stones to stone him, and the reason they were stoning him, they said, was because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Right. And so they knew. Now, we don't see that in our English, our modern English vernacular and, no. and grammar, but in the Jewish days, they knew what Jesus was claiming to be God when he claimed That's to be God's son. That's what the whole son. idea of Messiah was, mm -hmm. that God would come among them, okay, exactly. in the form of a man. Exactly. Now, now, one thing you didn't mention was, of course, when Jesus would pray. Jesus would pray to the Father. Was he praying to himself? Well, yes and no. He it was himself. He was the Father. He, he but God. this is the physical well, man. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, that's okay. This is, this is the physical man who is um, in this so tabernacle. He's yeah. not really praying to himself. No, you need to turn your volume down on your TV, ma'am. We can't talk oh, unless no your volume, volume's sorry. down. Yeah, really, it's, it's, it's hard. Okay. Okay, so what's your question? If he wasn't not talking to himself when he was praying, so isn't it make no sense to give us an example, say, pray to my father? He, he wasn't praying to himself. He was praying to God. And God is made up of three people, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The only time that that's really separated was during Christ's incarnation as a man. Okay, Christ's body was physically separated from the being of, of God. Okay. okay, but then, so that's why I'm getting confused. Okay. So 
you know, somebody told somebody. Excuse me. Excuse me for a minute. Hello. Excuse me for a minute. Somebody said, and I want to say this right here because we can talk about the Trinity forever, True. and and, and yeah. it's, it's a very difficult thing to grasp in our human mind. But somebody mentioned, and I'm going to say it here, it's so true. Once you can grasp the true doctrine of Jesus Christ, the Trinity will be no problem for you. No, I understand that. Because I, I, yeah. I, I listened to your show for a long time. Uh -huh. But even though when you say grasp the doctrine of the Trinity, in my mind, I still don't understand why there is in the Bible still an example of the Father talking to the Son and the Son talking or praying to the Father. So, but it's too, well, anyway, but that's my comment. Anyhow, oh, that's I, okay. I, I think that's what I make so confused when there is, you saying there is, you know, more than one God, but then in, the, in reality, in the Bible, one God, talking to the Father, one the God, father three, to his son, three so persons. there's two different things there. Yeah, I, I understand right, what right. you're saying. But it's yeah. one God, and then I believe that, that is only one God. Right. But then also the Son also was the God, isn't it? Right. They're all three equally God, mm -hmm. yes. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit equal one God. But of course... Uh, Christ in his physical okay. body during right, his incarnation. That, that's my comment. Thank oh, you. Okay. okay, thank you. Christ in his physical body in his incarnation had to do what a man would do. He okay. absolutely he lived had as to a man. eat, he had to, he had to, to sleep, mm -hmm. and he had to communicate with God. He had to okay. be man, dying He had to be man. man. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been man. God. He wouldn't have been a sacrifice that would be right. possible to propitiate for right. man. In fact, the, the mm -hmm. salvation would not be possible without. God being a trinity. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be possible. Line one, we have Trevor. Interesting line of thought, though. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, hello, Trevor? Yeah. Yes, you're on the air. Okay. What is your question or your comment? Trevor. Hi, can, can you hear me? We can. Well, hey, Trevor, we can go ahead. hear you. Yes. Would you please give okay, me Okay, yeah, yeah, I have a question for Charles. It's Charles, okay. correct? Yes, it is. Uh, Sean, my question is, what is your understanding of the difference between opinion and doctrine? Oh, well, <laughs> an opinion, everyone has one, <laughs> okay. A doctrine did you is, hear me? Yes, I did. He's can, talking. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I can't, I'm sorry. Okay, an opinion is something that everyone can have, and an opinion is based upon their own feelings, their own perceptions, and they can differ from other people. Sometimes they're significant, sometimes they're trivial, uh, sometimes they really don't matter. A doctrine is something that is founded upon God's repeatables. Okay, a doctrine cannot really be developed from something that is said once. Okay, mm -hmm. for instance, the idea of salvation by grace, the idea of faith atoning for mankind for being the only work that is acceptable before God. This is repeated over and over and over. It's not a one-shot wonder. So when a doctrine is developed, it is something that is that is perceived and understood, well, for a Christian from Scripture, I mean, every religion, I believe, has doctrines that are like that, but I would have to say that there's something that are consistent and repeatable throughout. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on, in, in terms of how, what doctrine is, and that it, doctrine must come from God. Yes. And I wanted to point out that the true doctrine. in true the doctrine must come Mormon from God. faith, mm -hmm. that the only doctrine that exists is that is, that is found in the canon, the script, the canon of the scriptures, being the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and uh, the Pearl of Great Price. So even if a, a even if a prophet speaks, such such as Joseph Smith or even the prophet today, it is still a matter of, unless it's directly stating something that is in the canon, it's still his own opinion. So to quote something that Orson Pratt said, or even something that Joseph Smith said. Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying here, Trevor. But that is not what the church has always I, taught. That is right. what the church I teaches that now. I understand that and, that, and that you would apply that, because just because Joseph Smith says something, and especially something from a book that Orson Pratt writes, <laughs> is not doctrine of the LDS church, but merely their opinions, which may or may not be true. Okay. And, and so and, how do we determine yeah. which is which? We, yeah. do we, does everybody just get to make up their own mind? There's, you don't have any yeah, guidelines. And, and unfortunately, that's one of the great challenges yeah. of 
developing a, a close relationship with God is being able to decipher doctrine and covenants, yeah. Trevor. Trevor, what is true and what is incorrect, and what we should base our questions, Trevor, and our thoughts on is what we find in the scriptures. The, Trevor, the Trevor, the problem is though that, that that Trevor is an opinion. Yeah. That's okay, an and opinion. that is an opinion which is propagated nowadays by leaders who don't want to be entrapped by teachings that earlier hey, so leaders would say. So, your, what you, you, just what you said, are saying is what an opinion. What you just said is an opinion. And by that, the way, that, that I want to say in Doctrine and Covenants 34 verses 5 through 10, Orson Pratt was called to prophesy. Now, if you want to reject all of the, your men that's called to prophesy, do so. But uh, we, we take what we read and what was claimed to be true. Yeah. We are winding the show down, Trevor. So if you've got just a couple of seconds sure, to please. say what you yeah. want to say. Well, I just, I just wanted to, to clarify that it, it is not a matter of opinion that what the church believes is doctrine is what's in the canon. Okay. Thank you very and, much. And, Okay. And we've we've heard that so many times before, we have, and, and, and we can't frankly, nail them down. It's, when, it's an opinion that what yeah. the church calls doctrine is in the canon, because frankly, Joseph Smith would have a very different opinion, and he would make it a doctrine. So. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. Well, Charles, thanks again for coming and oh, sharing what you, what Thank you're you. finding with mm -hmm. this. And we do appreciate uh, our callers who have called in and weighed in on this. Uh, those of us who were born and bred on the doctrines of Joseph Smith were taught from childhood that we preexisted in heaven in a premortal state. It was there, they say, that we made some choices that influenced our lives here. Choices we made in the preexistence include included what our skin color would be and, and if we could be born in the perfect religion that they said would be restored by Joseph Smith. Actually, these choices even determined if we would even be worthy enough to be born in a pre-mortal body or a mortal body I should say. As we've discussed tonight this entire doctrine is a Mormon myth and sadly this belief merely proves once again that Mormonism is a man-made belief system. We won't assume and won't even try to tell you what you can and cannot believe but please don't insult God by claiming he taught something when he obviously taught something otherwise. God is sovereign um, and uh, he alone made all those choices of our birth. He chose who and where and when each of us would be born. In Acts chapter 17, we learn that God made those birth decisions so that we would reach out for Him. So don't reach out for something or someone else. Reach out for Him. Reach out for the truth. Reach out for the one and only true God who is Jesus Christ. Don't reach out for polygamy. Don't reach out for Mormon myths. But trust in, um, in, in the truths of God's Word that He promised would endure forever and is not full of errors. Now, we uh, ask you again to consider watching our show next week as we celebrate our 200th live television show broadcast. Again, our special guest is going to be a Lamanite and is going to be dedicated to the Lamanites. So join us to commemorate the 200th broadcast and thanking God for every opportunity that we've had to share the truth with this culture. Amen. Thanks for watching and good night. Amen.